Exodus 12. I'm going to give you some of background verses. And this was, God put this on my heart years ago. In Exodus 12, verse 31, he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Now this is uh, Pharaoh saying this to Moses. Pharaoh is holding God's people in bondage. They're not allowed to do what God tells them to do. They're not allowed to have any freedom of their own. They're the slaves of the Egyptians, and their taskmasters are very cruel. Okay? Now, something I'm going to throw in here. A lot of times when Israel is put under cruel authority, they deserved it. But as you go from the end of Genesis into the first few chapters of Exodus, you don't see Israel committing the sins that they would commit later on as they're falling to worship Baal and Ashtoreth. You don't see that. So did God purposely allow his people to be afflicted even though they hadn't done, from what I can see, they had not as a nation done anything wrong. Not like they're capable of doing, even now. I believe God allowed them to be afflicted for righteousness sake. Okay? Something that really is in my heart here lately. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research into technology, and I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But I've said this before. At some point, we're going to have to push back on the technology and say, stay right here and go no further. Because it's getting scary. It's getting spooky scary. Okay? Well, I said I wasn't going to do this. They have a system called Argus. It's named after a Greek giant who received a deadly wound in his head and had his head cut off. That's Samson. Argus, his full name is Argus Panoptes. Pan means everything. Optes means eyes. In other words, Argus can see everything. So the Pentagon built drones that operate on solar energy, they can stay flying for months, and they're equipped with cameras. And they, f and they fly in a sort of pattern over a city. And they're constantly taking video. The computer behind that, that receives all that information, puts that information together of this entire city and can track everybody walking on the sidewalks and everybody's vehicle as it's moving and be able to identify it. Okay? That's already being done. So we have a system now where everybody is being watched all of the time. Okay? Um, that's the kind of spooky, scary stuff that we're getting into. There's more to it. But anyway, um, what was I, where was I going with that? That was really good. Bada boom. Anyway, here's God's people. They're in bondage, not for sins that they committed, but for righteousness' sake. They are God's people. God swore to Abraham that they would be in Egypt, they would be in bondage, and another Pharaoh would rise up, and God would deliver his people. And God even told Abraham the exact years that was going to pass between him and this happening. 400 years, okay? It happened just exactly the way God said it would. So anyway, here's Israel. They're in Pharaoh's bondage. Pharaoh has authority over them. It's cruel authority, all right? It's evil authority. Now God is going to remove his people from Pharaoh. So in verse 36, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now, let me tell you where I'm going with this. Our Christian forefathers who settled this nation were in bondage. The church of Rome had its tentacles and its claws and its net over practically every European nation with the exception of Great Britain. They had, the Vatican had control of Great Britain during the reign of Mary, Queen of Scots, because she was a fiercely devout Roman Catholic and set about to kill 
every Puritan that she could find. Okay, so that they had to move to Holland. By the time King James comes around, he is totally not Mary Queen of Scots. He is a Protestant, from what I can tell, a Protestant, God-fearing king. And God put it in his heart to have this Bible translated. The king started to show these Puritans favor and blessing them. So that when they said, we would like to, you know, King James, it's great that you're still here and you're giving us all this freedom, but what's going to happen after you die? Who's going to come in after you and going to go right back to trying to kill us Bible believers? So they said, we need out of this bondage. We need out. So God called these people from 1620, I'm going to say probably for the next 50, 60, 70 years, it's called the Great Migration. Have you studied that, J.R., yet? Well, it'd be good if you can find it in some lesson and teach them that, because, I mean, it's awesome. But you, God is leading all of these Bible-believing Christians out of Europe. And to this day, Europe is not known for its Bible-believing capabilities. Okay? And God took them out and blessed them as they went. So then in Exodus 34, it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, verse 29, with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So, here's what happens. They're, they get set free from the bondage that they're in. Their first trips that they made uh, started in the 1615, 1620, somewhere around, I think 1619, 1620. Well, do the math. This Bible started receiving its first publication in 1611. And even though the Puritans didn't really like, they didn't latch on to the King James Bible immediately, they were using the Geneva Bible because it had a lot of stuff in there that they liked, like all the kings are evil, and that's what they believed. So anyway, um, at, at some point, there was a transition, even in the Puritans, where they slowly but surely got away from the Geneva and it may have something to do with the fact that now that they're overseas in the promised land, they don't have access to the printing capabilities to pr print the Geneva Bible, and they just make this transition to the King James Bible. Okay? And what I'm showing you is, God did something similar. At least in my mind, God did something very similar with his Bible-believing people who were in bondage in a, in a terrible way, God gave them, just like here in Exodus 34, God gave them His law, His commandments, His covenant. That's what He did. He gave them the copy of His Word. And, um, I, I think I'm missing something here. In Exodus 14, they get to cross the sea over into the promised land. And that's what our Christian forefathers did. So they're in bondage. God gives them a copy of His Word. They go across the sea into a land that they felt, they really believed that they saw in themselves the people of Israel. That's what they saw. Okay? So then in Joshua chapter 1 verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, down all this people under the land. You see, even as at the end of Moses' life and Joshua takes over, in order to get into the land of Israel, they could have gone any other way. The southern, the southern area of Israel pretty much connects to Egypt. They could have just marched from south to north right into the Promised Land, but God did not lead them that way. God led them all the way around to the eastern side of the Jordan River. What direction does the sun come up? East, okay? Uh, even in the tabernacle, everything went east to west. He made them stop at the River Jordan. Um, they crossed the River Jordan. It did one of these, just like the Red Sea, and they crossed over on dry ground and they made it into the Promised Land. Anytime you see someone passing through a river or a sea, the Bible teaches you it's a type of baptism. It's what it is. Okay? They were all baptized under Moses, Paul said. Uh, same way with Joshua. They were baptized under Joshua. They were crossing the Jordan River and now they're in the Promised Land. My little theory on that is, is that between this world and heaven, there is water or something 
along that line, a spiritual type of ocean or sea that we cannot pass through except God provides the way. Okay? Because even in the songs we sing, there's one in the hymn book called I Won't Have to Cross Jordan Alone. And what it means is there is a water thing between us and heaven, and when we, it's time for us to go to heaven, we're going to have to cross Jordan just like the Israelites did. But God's going to make that way. So anyway, and then he said in uh, verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. And I know, there's, I know this is going to be contentiously debated among some people. But the truth of the matter is, God allowed those people to come from Europe over to this land. And I think a lot of them really wanted to be at peace with the native, with the Indian. But in some cases, the Indians just weren't going to have it, and they started a war, and all of those wars, they lost. God literally gave our forefathers, as they walked across this land, God gave them that land. And if God didn't want them to have it, we wouldn't be here. Okay, it's that simple. So anyway, that's the setup for you. And so that's what I see here. God's people in bondage. He gives them the word. They cross the sea. Now they're in the promised land. So... When I look at, and you can say, well, Pastor, that's your theory. I think you're all washed up, something wrong with you. Um, when I read their quotations and what they really believe, okay, that's what I see here. Uh, let's see here. This is, this is kind of where I left off this morning. Um, Harvard University, who's ever heard of Harvard. How did that, what was that school, Miss Linda, when they started it? What kind of school was it? It was a seminary. Harvard was a Calvinist seminary training ministers to preach the gospel. That was their biggest thing. That's how they got started. So here is, if you wanted to apply to Harvard in the 1630s, here was the commandments you were given. You had to agree to this. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God in Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Caleb, Isaac, Callie, J.R., uh, Huey and Dewey, okay? You guys are all homeschooled, okay? And maybe you think, well, if I went to public school, I could have this and I could have that and do this and do that, Okay? The way the public school is wanting to teach you will never lead you to Christ and eternal life. Will never do it. They're going to lead you away from it. Okay? The purpose of your education right now is to instruct you well enough so that you can know, you can read, understand, and know what this Bible says. That's what he was saying right there. The aim of their of their schooling, their, their studies, is to find Christ and eternal life. That was their goal. Uh, John 17, 3. And therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning, and seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom. That doesn't sound like Harvard now, does it? The Lord only giveth wisdom. Let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. Proverbs 2, 3. And number three, everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day, was their requirement, that, shall, uh, that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein, both in theoretical observations of language and logic, and in practical and spiritual truths, as his tutor shall require. According to his ability, seeing the entrance of the word giveth light, he giveth understanding to the simple. I just want to shout when I read stuff like this. Because what Harvard is telling their students is, we're going to demand that you read the Bible twice a day, and then we're going to quiz you on it. And if you don't give us the right answers, you can go back to raising pigs for a living if you want. Okay? But that's, we're not going to do that. And then number four, that they eschewing all profanation of God's name, which means that they didn't say, well, I won't say it. They didn't say this word and that word and that word. They did not take God's name into vulgarity. Okay? 
Uh, all profanation of God's name, attributes, words, ordinances, and times of worship, do study with good conscience carefully to retain God and the love of his truth in their minds, else let them know that notwithstanding their learning, God may give them up to strong delusion and in the end, a reprobate mind. Harvard, in this thing, was using Bible prophecy to, because it was the end goal to train people enough so that they're not being deceived in the strong delusion that God's going to turn everybody over to. In other words, the purpose of you reading this Bible is so that you know Christ because the counterfeit is coming. Okay? And so that was Harvard University's stated goal was to train men well enough so that the devil did not deceive them. Amen! Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Now here is... Increase Mather, he is the son of, well, he's not the son of John Cotton. There's, there's another guy named Cotton Mather. I think that's why I got it. But anyway, he was the president of Harvard. And here's, uh, here's what happened. When King Charles II demanded the return of the Charter of Massachusetts, Increase Mather prepared his response. In other words, King Charles didn't like what was going on in Massachusetts. And it was he chartered the people to go colonize that. And for whatever reason, he was going to pull that charter away, which means all of those people were going to be on that land illegally. And he would tear down their cities or whatever. But anyway, here's, here's what happened. Here's what Increase Mather said. To submit and resign their charter would be inconsistent with the main end of their fathers coming to New England. Resistance would bring great sufferings, but better to suffer than sin. Let them trust in the God of their fathers, which is better than to put confidence in princes, and if they suffer because they dare not comply with the wills of men against the will of God, they suffer in a good cause. And again, you don't hear people talking like that anymore. Connecticut. Connecticut is formed as a colony. They must have a government in Connecticut. So here is something similar to a constitution. It's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. This was done in 1639. So that's what, 28 years after the King James Bible? Let's look at the effect. Okay? It was the first constitution written in America, establishing a pattern which all others followed, including our own United States Constitution. It was penned by Roger Ludlow after hearing a sermon by Thomas Hooker, the Puritan minister who founded Hartford, Connecticut. So important was this work that Connecticut became known as the Constitution State. The committee, and here's the charge for the committee to, responsible for framing this constitution. The committee responsible to frame the orders was charged to make the laws, quote, as near the law of God as they can be. In other words, in Connecticut, Connecticut's birth was God-fearing and God's law respected so highly that their constitution said, when you start framing laws, you make sure that they are as close to the Word of God as they possibly can be. So, needless to say, they put in laws during, back in these days. Who remembers the day when you couldn't buy liquor on Sunday? You shouldn't have been buying it on Sunday to begin with. But that was a law. That was a law in the state of Missouri that you honor the Lord's Day and nobody's selling alcoholic beverages. Where is that law now? Repealed it. They're moving away from God's law. God says that it's a man with a woman. That's marriage. That's what God's word says. And for all of our history in this country, that was the law of the land. It's not there anymore. Even after we voted... Ten some odd years ago, 80% of the people of the state of Missouri changed the Constitution to say marriage is between one man and one woman. The Supreme Court, just like that, overthrew that. That's our law. And I'll tell you this, uh, Mayor Francis Slay up here in St. Louis is going to have his day in God's court because he deliberately, illegally married sodomites in St. Louis just so the lawsuit would take it to the Supreme Court. Because they figured they had the votes. Okay? This is how far we've come. Uh, here's what he said here. For as much as it has pleased the Almighty God by the wise disposition of His divine providence so to order and dispose of things that we inhabitants and residents of Windsor, Hartford, and 
You probably, they probably sent it Windsor, Hartford, and Weathersfield. Okay? And now cohabitating and dwelling in and upon the river Connecticut and the lands there to adjoining, and well knowing when a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such a people that there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God to order and dispose of the affairs of all the people at all seasons as occasion shall require do therefore associate and conjoin ourselves to be one as, uh, as one public state or commonwealth and do for ourselves and our successors as such as shall be adjoined to us at any time hereafter enter into combination and confederation together to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. Amen. We don't have laws like that anymore. We don't have preambles like that. But that was the purpose of the government, was to preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel. That was it. Uh, as also the discipline of the churches, which according to the truth of the said gospel is now practiced amongst us as... Also, in our, in our civil affairs, to be guided and governed according to such laws, rules, and orders, and decrees. But it was all based on the King James Bible. Because by this time, the King James has, has taken hold the first book ever printed in the United States of America was, guess what? King James Bible. And it came to such a time as Congress actually gathered together, Jared, and voted that they commissioned this, this printer in Philadelphia that he print a certain number of King James Bibles. The government paid for them so that all the soldiers fighting in the revolution would have Bibles with them to give them aid and comfort while they were fighting for their liberty. We don't, we don't have that anymore. Um, here's the oath. If you were going to be the oath of the governor of Connecticut, if you are going to be the governor of Connecticut, here's your oath. Being now chosen to be governor within this jurisdiction for the year ensuing and until a new be chosen, do swear by the great and dreadful name of the ever-living God to promote the public good and peace of the same according to the best of my skill, as also will maintain all lawful privileges of this commonwealth, as also that all wholesome laws that are, that are and shall be made lawful in authority here established, be duly executed, and, here's his oath, will further the execution of justice according to the rule of God's word, so help me God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we live in such a time as when Rick Warren prayed the inauguration prayer at Obama's first inauguration, he refused to say the name Jesus. Okay? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm getting that wrong. He did... But then he included the Muslim Jesus, Isa. You go, you go to YouTube and type in Rick Warren's prayer and you'll hear it. He invoked the name of other gods in a blessing over that president and over this nation. That would have never, never been allowed at this time. You, couldn't run, you could not run for public office and, and believe that lie. Uh, here's what Article 1 of their Constitution said, that the Scriptures hold forth a perfect rule for the direction and government of all men and all duties which they are to perform to God and men as well in families and commonwealth as in matters of the church. That's in their Constitution. It's not there anymore, but that was in their original laws that ruled Connecticut. Article 2, that is in matters which concern the gathering and ordering of a church, so likewise in all public offices which concern civil order as the choice of magistrates and officers, making and repealing laws, dividing allotments of the inheritance and all things of like nature, they would all be governed by those rules which the Scripture hold forth to them. The Bible was final. The Bible, in their minds, had the authority over their Constitution. That's what I still believe. That if God's law requires me to do something, and man's law seeks to prohibit that, I have to choose God's law over man's. Yes. So, let me just ask you. Do you foresee a time coming? The pendulum's going to swing back the other way. And they will take that opportunity to further encroach on our ability as a church to say certain things that are in this Bible, such as sodomites go to hell. Okay? To say those things 
there's going to come a time. Do you think that time is coming when they're going to try to cut that off from what we say and do? Not just our church, but all the rest of them. And some of them have already complied with that, and it's not even a rule. They have already refused, Mike, to say gay is bad, homosexual is bad, sodom they don't use the word sodomite because they don't, they don't have a Bible within it. Okay? But that's what they already do. And at some point, we're not going to be able to live under the liberties that we live under right now. Amen? We have a family, and I want you to pray for them. Her name is Laura. She's a follower of this church. Uh, she's in, the, I think, the group on Facebook. She in that group, okay? She lost her whole house to fire the other day. I didn't see the pictures. But was it totally, her house totally burned up. Everything that she had gone with the exception. They found her King James Bible in there. It's charred, but it was there. Okay? Did I say that right? Because you saw the picture. Okay? Here's the thing. This lady, and I guess her family, has just lost every possession they had. Just like that. But they still have the Lord, don't they? And um, I've told, told the family, and I'm telling you guys, I'm telling those that watch us, if we can help out for this family with anything, I think we ought to do it. Okay, uh, but anyway, um, what was I saying about all this? Anyway, let's move on. I've been losing, I've losing my train of thought three times today already. Constitution of New England, Confederation, 1643. Oh, here's what, I'm, here's what I was saying. When you lose everything you've got in a fire, there are some things that are so precious that you cannot live without. She can live out without the hair dryer, the bed sheets, she can live without the couches and the paintings on the walls and everything like that. But we can't live very well without our family, knowing our family died in the fire, and our Bibles. So instantly, the things that we take for granted every day can be gone just like that. Right? Including our faith. So, as we see the day approaching, and they're starting to take away the blessings of this Bible and the words of this Bible, it's going to become precious to us. And we'll not ever go a day without reading the Word of God. It'll be that precious to us. But that's a good cause, is it not? So, if, in, and again, you don't have to answer this out loud, if you lost everything, or you have salvation. What are you willing to lose for the sake of your salvation? The answer should be everything. Paul said, I'm counting all things but loss. Okay? So when Paul died, when he had his head cut off, he didn't have any further reason for hanging around down here because he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But everything that he was and everything that he had became precious because it was taken away. And our freedoms to come in this church and talk this way, those are being carved at and taken away slowly but surely. And would you be willing to lose, would you be willing to lose your job for the gospel's sake? Would you be willing to lose your 401k? Would you be willing to lose your social security or your pension or your uh, Medicare, your government health care, whatever, would you be willing to lose these things just to keep the Word of God, just to keep your faith? You have to ask yourself that question because these days, these things that our founding fathers did for us, they're becoming more and more precious to me as I see this country getting darker and darker and darker. Amen? So here's the Constitution of New England, 1643, whereas we all came to these parts of America with the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to enjoy the liberties of the gospel thereof with purities and peace and for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel. The Southern Poverty Law Center didn't, was not at this time. The NAACP was not here. The ACLU was not here. These are all the extremist groups that 
are out to protect anybody who hates Jesus, but not protect the people who love Jesus. That was not our country back in years gone by. New Haven Colony, Charter 1644, the judicial laws of God as they were delivered by Moses to be a rule in all the courts in this jurisdiction. And Roy Moore, banned from his own courtroom because he insisted on hanging a copy of the Ten Commandments in his courtroom, which to me is very hypocritical because if you ever get the chance to go into the Supreme Court chambers, carved on the doorway to this chamber is an image of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. Because it was recognized that those commandments were the basis and foundation of our laws in this country. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not... Things like that, okay? Uh, oh, this is one of my favorites, okay? I'm going to read this and maybe a couple other things. I'm going to let you go. The old deluder Satan law. T write that in, write that down, do some research on it. 1647. Now, about this time, the King James Bible is starting to really gain... The Geneva Bible, at a certain point, they just quit printing it and because nobody was reading it. So the King James was moving in at this time. And so in 1647, in Massachusetts, their state legislature passed a law called the Old Deluder Satan Law. And here's what it says. It being one chief project of that Old Deluder Satan to keep men... And you can tell these guys spent a lot of time learning the Bible instead of spelling. Okay? To keep men from the knowledge of the Scriptures. How many of you believe that? Satan's number one goal is to keep you from knowing this Bible. Because if you know this truth, he cannot deceive you. Amen? He cannot deceive you if you know the truth. So, watch this. As in former time... And that learning may not be buried in the grave of our forefathers in church and commonwealth. That is a very deep statement. The faith that our founding fathers had is gone. You know why? The founding fathers are gone. It is up to us in this generation to carry the torch, number one, of God's word in this nation. Number two, to carry the torch of our constitutional liberties. Amen? You guys ready to turn your guns in yet? To the government? You're not ready for that? Because the day after they take the guns, the Bibles are gone too. Mark it down. One freedom is always going to be related to another. And if the government can do have this much power today... That sets the new standard, and they will take more of it tomorrow. How many of y'all believe that? Okay? So w watch this. It is therefore ordered by this court that every township within this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of 50 householders. I, I just love the way they're saying this. They didn't even believe that their that Massachusetts would grow as a colony except the Lord increased them. Because that's what that says. Every township within this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of 50 householders. The Lord increased them. Because that's what God does. God says, be blessed, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish. And that's exactly what happened. So here's what it says. Um, when they have 50 householders, shall forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read. And it is further ordered that wherein any town shall increase to the number of 100 families or householders, they shall set up a grammar school, which would be high school, for the university. Okay? To teach the children how to read and write so they could do one thing. Which is what? Read the Bible. Okay? So, that at that time was the heart of the people. And again, I don't think every one of these people were born again and we're going to see all the founding fathers in heaven. I don't believe that. There was enough of them that had a respect for God and enough of the people who lived at that time 
who had a, had a reverence and a respect for God and his law. We don't have that anymore. In the years that I've been pastor here, they've thrown, I don't know how many beer bottles out, hit our church sign, just splatting beer all over it, uh, throwing their cigarette packages down in the yard, throwing their old beer cans out in the yard. On two separate occasions, we've had men come into our parking lot one time when these kids were just getting out of school in the parking lot, take a leak in the parking lot on two separate occasions. Okay? The people that pass up and down these streets don't care anything about a church being here at all. Not one thing. This is how far we've got. Do you think such legislature like this could ever be passed now? Not a chance. Even if it was by one state, ACLU would step in and have it overthrown. Okay? This is where we are right now. But the purpose of the deluder Satan law was to educate people enough so that they could not be deceived by Satan. And look at our nation now. People are embracing communism. Who remembers a day when if you were a communist, you should be dead in America? Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Okay. There was a time when if you were a sodomite, you didn't, you didn't have a very good life. Okay? There was, t there was a time in this nation when the people still respected the house of God, the place of worship. They don't anymore. They don't care. They think nothing of it. And so what's happened is, since 1963, the Supreme Court outlawed every school in America from opening with prayer. Made it illegal to pray as a school. Then, making sure the Bible gets removed from the classroom. So what have we seen happen in our country since 1963? Let me, let me put it in order for you. 1963, Supreme Court throws out public school prayer and thus throws out the Word of God. And as a, I think as a partial consequence of that, Americans got to see one of her most beloved presidents with his head blown off. JFK, John F. Kennedy. Okay? And from 1963 on, what happened with the youth of our nation once they took prayer out? From 63, they grew up and then they went to Woodstock. Six years later, they're at Woodstock. And Woods, if you were to compare... American culture at Woodstock with the American culture just 10 years ago when my dad graduated high school. You would say that this, this is not America. This can't be America. Americans don't dress like this. They don't do stuff like this. They don't run around naked and playing this kind of music. Americans don't do that. But because the devil succeeded in making sure that our public school children have almost no knowledge of the word of God, now they're accepting all sorts of false ideas about government. We will be transitioned to a socialist or a communist nation as time goes on. Our constitution is built upon the foundation of the word of God and if they remove the word of God, what, what happens to our constitution? Gone. Okay? Without, without that foundation, what's built on it is going to fall and it's built upon the foundation of the word of God. So since we removed the knowledge of the word of God from our public school students, they now believe in socialism, communism. They're reading Marxist. We elected a president of the United States for eight years who have swore to everybody that he was a Marxist, Barack Obama. And be uh, believing communist is what he was. And communism is directly against the word of God. Okay? And it does not allow for the practicing of the preaching of the word of God. Anyway, here's what I'm saying. We have already seen the results in our lifetime of what happens when you remove the word of God and prayer from people. What happens to their children? What happens when those teenagers at Woodstock grow up, now they're running companies, and now they're promoting things in this country that is just absolutely going to destroy us. Okay? And all of that is done because people's ignorance 
of the Word of God and what it brings. You see, you see why this is such, to me, it's a big deal. Learning where we came from so that when these people on the news and these people in Congress or whatever try to tell you that, well, we need to be open and free society. We need to embrace everybody. You know what? If they want to come in legally, let them come in. But don't tell me I can't preach the gospel to them. Amen? Because they need to hear it. And we've already seen the results of what happens when the word of God is taken away from a generation of people. I wonder what we could see if Melissa was successful in getting through to J.R. and Caleb and Isaac and Callie and Michaela. Who else? Jane, okay. If she was successful in her ministry to get the word of God founded in their lives so that when the storms come by in their lives six years from now, seven years from now, they're able to withstand it because of the foundation of God's word. They're not going to fall for stuff. And this is what we pray for. Okay? I love you. Because he decided that his girl... Look at, look at these people. Look at that. Isn't that sickening? Daddy holding his daughters like that. Sickening. Isn't it, Courtney? Do you believe daughters walking their dad? I know it. But God put it in his heart how long ago? Homeschool? Three and a half, almost four years ago. Three and a half, almost four years ago. What grade are they in? What grade are you in? Eighth? Eighth grade. I can remember in eighth grade, I was being introduced to literally everything under the sun in junior high school. Not being physically strong enough to resist all of it. Okay? That was done at a public school. And now, these kids have an opportunity to not have that stuff shoved down their throat and the ability to be raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and His Word. So, guys, don't despise where you're going to school. Who in here of you parents wished you would have been trained better as a child with the Word of God? Okay? We're old people telling you, J.R. and Caleb and all the rest of you guys, quit complaining about memorizing the Bible verse in your pace. Right? They, they do paces, by the way, just like our kids do. Don't complain about memorizing those scripture verses. Don't complain about your history book teaching you that evolution's a lie and that Noah did really ride on a boat 300 cubits long and there was a worldwide flood and the earth is not 5.4 billion years old. It was created by God and that's our family. So you remember your creator in the days of your youth. And who's to say that God's not going to use J.R. or Caleb or even Callie or Pickle and Pickle here. I, I, I can't remember their names, so I just make something up, okay? Who's to say that God's not going to use one of these guys with that solid foundation to carry this church farther as the Lord tarries his coming or to even change our entire nation? When God sent judges to the nation of Israel and judges, the book of Judges, you know how, how many he sent at a time? Gideon made a difference amongst his people, and he was just one man. Samson made a difference amongst his people, and he was just one man. So who are you? Did David have his weaknesses? Yes. Did Samson have his weaknesses? Yes. Did Gideon have his weaknesses? Yes. But that's where God is strong in our weaknesses, okay? So, learn your history. Learn where you really, where we really came from in this nation. And it should make you weep over where we are now. It should make us weep. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You stand up. I could, I could read these things all day long. Charter of Rhode Island, Char Charter of Carolina. Um, 
for the propagation of the Christian faith. Um, Peter Bulkley saying that we as America are a city set on, on a hill. Where did he get that from? He got that from the scriptures. I'm telling you, these guys, 1600s, early 1700s, they believed that what was happening in America, they were reading it from the Old Testament because God did it that way with the Jews. That's what they really believed. And I don't think they were wrong. I don't think they were wrong at all. I think God had a special purpose for this nation. And there has not been a nation anywhere at any time that has done more to spread the gospel than the United States of America. The denominations got their early start in Europe. But when they came here and were planted, they found very fertile ground. And God used these denominations all throughout the years to send missionaries all over the world to preach the gospel to these people. What are we doing now? We're selling them Joel Osteen books. Ain't right. Amen? I love my country. And I'm very thankful that I have the liberty to say what I believe God tells me to say. And I don't want trouble over it. I don't want to be arrested over it. I don't want to have to pay a fine or lose this building or whatever. But it's not going to stop me. It's not going to stop any of us, is it? Because this is all we've got. Amen? Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for this Bible. And Lord, it does, it really does speak to every generation that's ever lived. It speaks very loudly, it speaks very plainly. And every part of our lives can be seen in this book. And Lord, even our nation and its triumphs and its wickedness its blessings and its cursings, Father. Our nation can be seen in the Word of God and what you're doing and what you're going to do. So, Father, I know what your Bible says about a nation that turns their back on God. I know what you said you would do. And, God, I don't want that to happen. But I know you're wiser than I am, Father, so I'll let you do what you know is best. But, Father, every day I'm going to pray for my country and for my people that we keep having the liberty that we have. So Father, this time of year we start making a list in our mind of things that we're thankful for. And Father, the, one of the best things and the biggest things that I'm thankful for, Lord, is that you birthed me as an American. And Lord, you've even brought others over here who have had a new birth as an American. Father, help us to love our country, pray for our country, stand for our country, stand for what's right. And don't let the devil try to stop us. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us today. Thank you, Lord, for an awesome day. Thank you, Lord, for this good food and your word. We love you in Jesus' name. All of God's people said.